everyone, and welcome to Empowering Homeschool Conversations. My name is Peggy Ployer, and I'm the host of this weekly broadcast put on by Sped Homeschool, as well as the founder and CEO of Sped Homeschool. And we at Homeschool, Sped Homeschool, we empower families to home educate children with learning challenges. And I encourage you to check out our website at spedhomeschool.com to learn more about the resources and support we offer families. Some of the best resources that we have on our website are our partners. And so I encourage you to check out our curriculum partners, our um, blogging partners, uh, our therapy partners. We have a whole slew of different partners that um, are vetted resources on our website. And so um, so those are some highlights. I know a lot of people just go directly to the blogs or to the curriculum, but there's a whole lot more there as well. So um, tonight, though, we are wrapping up a theme that we've been working on this entire month as we're talking about different public funding um, resources that homeschool families who have struggling students can take advantage of. Now, we, we have addressed um, some specific ones in our first broadcast and also the pros and cons with one of the lawyers from HSLDA last week. But tonight, we have some families sharing their stories, and I'm excited to introduce you to, to all my guests. We have um, Natchez Phelps. We have Marie um, Porticano. Is that correct? Porticano. For, uh, you say it better than I do. <laughs> And Cynthia Heron. Um, and I know Natchez and Cynthia have been on the show before. And so welcome back, ladies. And Marie, I'm excited to have you on for the first time. Mm -hmm. So we are just going to kind of go through their family stories. And so you're going to learn a lot about them. And um, they're going to just share some of the experiences that they have had using different programs um, that they've used with their, their students. And um, kind of share... A, a kind of a, a family, you know, in the trenches type of perspective that we haven't addressed yet because we've addressed it from the funding point, we've addressed it from the legal point, and now we're going to address it from the practical point. <laughs> this is what it looks like in your home. So, um, so thank you, ladies, for taking time out of your busy schedules. This is a crazy week with Christmas, and I just appreciate you being here with us tonight. So, um, as we get started, I think the first question that I have is, um, I would just love for you to tell us a little bit about your family, what prompted you to start homeschooling, and did public funding or programs, their availability, contribute to your decision to homeschool? Who would like to go first? <laughs> I can go. Okay. Um, so I live in Illinois right now, and we homeschool three kids. They are 8, 11, and 12 at the time of this recording. Um, and for, we've homeschooled for eight years. And for us, it was my own ex education experience that made me want to pursue something different for my own kids. Mm. Um, my elementary school experience, public elementary school experience was very unique and that our, the principal in our local district was given a lot of leeway to do a variety of very well, by today's standards, it'd be highly unusual in a public school mm. classroom. And that there was a lot of Montessori learning, unit studies, mm. um, hands-on, very project-based. I was even in multi-grade classrooms for four mm. out of the six years of K-5. Um, oh. And that was all really valuable. And I learned a lot that way. And mm. I basically realized if I wanted to give my kids some of those opportunities, that I had to homeschool them, even though that was based on my public school experience. <laughs> That's very um, interesting. Yeah. So as well as I also um, am gifted as well. And so being able to have some of those different educational means and let my kids run or walk however mm -hmm. they wanted through their education um, was going to have all that flexibility was going to have to look like something like homeschooling. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't know at the time that... Now I know that I have three kids with three different learning disability. One has mm. dyslexia, one has dyscalculia, and one has dysgraphia. Um, in addition to anxiety wow. and ADHD and um, autism also in the mix mm. in different kids. Um, mm -hmm. And multiple kids have some of those things as well. The crossover, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So those extra needs keep us homeschooling um, mm. because they know and I know that this is how we can best meet their needs and support their whole well-being as a person wow. um, holistically by keeping our education at home and then pursuing what other outside opportunities we want individually. Yeah, so, mm -hmm. great. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing that. Um, so Marie or Nate Our like son 
Lake. Yeah. Well, we live in the Poconos in, we're in Pennsylvania. Our mm-hmm. son Blake, now he's seven years old, and he was diagnosed with autism uh, at the age of three. Okay. Uh, we did follow the expert's recommendation to do early intervention. We were able to see some progress, but it wasn't until we actually found a preschool setting that would actually accept him that we were mm-hmm. able to see big progress big progress. Um, it's sad to say, but finding a preschool that would accept him in our area was extremely difficult, even if we mm. wanted to pay extra for that. And that was sad to see, but but that was the reality right. we were yeah. dealing with. Mm-hmm. So when we started with early intervention, intervention, we kept looking into different services and possibilities that were offered to see if there was something that he can benefit from. But mm-hmm. we did not jump to it because first we didn't know what we were dealing with. Right. So we just wanted to make sure that uh, whatever it is that we're going to choose, it has to be something that is going to work for him. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, after after paying attention and observing as he, we saw him develop, we can see that academically he was at par with his peers, but socially he was lagging way behind. Right. So, uh, you know, we we decided we have to separate those two aspects and we have to treat it Mm. differently. Mm. Um, That was something that was conveyed when uh, school age came and uh, he needed to go, you know, uh, to the brick and mortar school. Mm -hmm. Uh, We presented it to the school and the school totally dismissed us. (laughs) They say, Mm -hmm. no, we are the experts. We're going to do whatever they felt like they wanted to do. And it was to isolate him in a classroom uh, for most of the time, and then just send him out with the typical children for just uh, lunch and recess. Mm. Talk about extremes. Right. How is he going to? It, it just it, it didn't it didn't work for us. We were like that doesn't make any sense. Uh, I'm telling you, he's okay with the school setting, but he uh, has trouble communicating. That's mm. the only problem he has. So. So when we, we decided, we said, well, all right, we tried that. We tried a uh, private school. It was mm-hmm. worse than ever. That was even worse. <laughs> because they wouldn't even go with IEPs. It didn't matter. There was right. No That's They're pretty typical. Make, That's they good they to point out. Mm-hmm. They're going to do, you know, how to say. So, well, we said, all right. Um, we didn't want to put more trauma than it was needed. Because mm-hmm. they're very sensitive. My kid, uh, you know, uh, autism in, in general, they 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 take in so much. They, mm-hmm. it's so true. They it's just uh, the stimulation can be overloaded too much. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. so we figure, you know, we um, is is the brick and mortar school going to help? It's not going to help. Private schools doesn't help. So then we say, you know, okay, so we're going to research and we're going to look to see what can we do. And then we decided to do the cyber schooling. Mm-hmm. Mm. Uh, we found one that he has been for about 25 years. They are very good with the IEP right away. They were, mm. they made us feel like we were the experts that we knew exactly what our child needed. Um, and that was big. That was mm-hmm. really big. Um, you know, they recognize that we as parents and we understand better than, than, than anybody else. And so, mm-hmm. We continue. They did the, 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 um, the lessons that they give a, a synchronous. So he doesn't have to be in front of the computer all the time. No, it's only once That's a week good. that he is, mm-hmm. you know, with the teacher and then everything else is um, given ahead of time. And they give you only a week to finish it. I sit down with him and I do this stuff. And little by little, this is our second year. Now he's starting to do more independent things. <laughs> Um, yeah, when he, well, that's wonderful. Yes, yeah. yes. And and so he does get to have a couple of classes online if he chooses to. He doesn't have to. But if he chooses, as long as the work is completed and and, and they, I record him doing his reading, doing his math, and it's just unbelievable. I, I, am, I am in shock on how much he has, you know, the progress that he has made. And so we're thrilled. We're thrilled. I, some of the stuff that they have, which is, um, you know, a speech therapy, occupational therapy, and, and everything is just starting to fade away. Mm-hmm. And it's because he is just not needing it anymore. That's great. But it's nice that you found a cyber school that has that because not all of them do. Mm-hmm. And and But it, get, it helped you to get into kind of this homeschooling mode um, a little bit more comfortably. So, so that, that's awesome that, that, that was a bridge for you. 
It, it was a bridge. Yeah. And, and, mm-hmm. and one of the things that, you know, I, I made a point is to actually find groups, um, homeschool groups. Mm-hmm. And that's where I compensate the, the, the socialization part, socialization. the social yeah. part. And, and it's, it, we've been doing it for a couple of years now and it's just beautiful. Like I said, I, I still don't have, I, I would say the, um, hmm. I'm not too confident about doing the homeschooling because I know <laughs> it's just you have to be organized. And I'm sure it's, it's to me, it's, it's it's a lot of work. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, I need to feel that, I'm, you know, I'm accountable to someone that this is what it is. Because otherwise I'm going to be like, I'm going to fall into the cracks. And it's just and that will be a me thing. It's right. just a me thing. And, and that's so important to point out because you don't just choose how you homeschool based on your children. You choose how you homeschool based on how you teach as well. So thank you for, for pointing that out and for sharing your story. How about you, Najes? Okay, so um, I have three kids. but I have two boys and a girl. My two boys are on the autism spectrum, and they could not be more opposite. My oldest, he is 14 now. And um, he is considered functionally nonverbal. He does have profound, severe autism. Um, and then my younger son, he is 11. And um, he is the opposite of my older one, who's very like Ferdinand the Bull. He loves peace and serenity. He's content, you know, by mm-hmm. himself, smelling <laughs> flowers. Like that's just kind of who he is. Um, and my younger son, he likes everything loud and he loves rock music and being on stage and musical theater. Um, and so my boys are very, very different. Oh, and my younger son too. It's interesting. It's hard to get him to stop talking as to where you can't get big brother to start talking. Mm-hmm. And so, um, they're, so they are complete opposites in just about every way. Um, I would say that our journey to homeschool was, um, I guess the sort of process of elimination, you know, for, uh, <laughs> My my older son, when he was young, right, we were just busy looking for the right fit for him. Like mm-hmm. um, we went to visit our local public school. PPCD didn't seem quite right. We found, um, you know, a private special needs school. We tried that. That wasn't the right fit. We tried ABA. Mm-hmm. That wasn't the right fit. We brought him mm-hmm. home. We put him back in public. Um, I mean, we've just, we've tried so many different things mm-hmm. and... I think too, when the kids are little, um, sometimes maybe the experts know immediately how to uh, meet their needs, Mm -hmm. but sometimes they just, they're they're trying different things and they just don't work. I know that's been um, Mm -hmm. the process with my older son. He's always had some language, but it was like his verbal language plateaued. And so we could say maybe his name or he was very echolalic, but then AAC opens up a world for him that he didn't Mm -hmm. have access to previously. Um, One of the issues that we ran into um, was everybody wanted to teach him how to use more and more language. And we kept on Mm -hmm. saying, we'd really like to try AAC, but Mm -hmm. everybody would say, no, he's got some language. Let's keep trying. And so Mm -hmm. that was... So that was our frustration and it Mm -hmm. took us leaving public school, going to um, an ABA clinic to who really listened to us and really helped Mm -hmm. him learn AAC. And then when that was no longer available, it was either, okay, go back to public school or homeschool. Mm -hmm. And so we decided that we're going to, we're going to try to homeschool this time and see how Mm -hmm. it goes. And I would say that it's not the perfect fit, but it is the right fit for right now. I love um, that. Yeah. And then for uh, my younger son, uh, having known, I guess, kind of what was out there because we had already been out, out there with him, mm-hmm. we uh-huh. knew which schools, which places we wanted to try. Uh, we thought that public school would be a decent fit. He started in PPCD and um, he he did well. They had, at the time, they had a general education teacher in there and also a special education teacher. So they were able to meet mm-hmm. both of his needs. But then as he grew older, um, they couldn't ever find the right fit. General education wanted to put him in a special education classroom. Special ed wanted to put him in gen ed. And so long as we had teachers and administrators, 
that were willing to work with us, then mm-hmm. it was wonderful. It was a fantastic fit. But if we didn't get that right team, then it was a struggle. And I just ultimately had to decide, am I going to continue to advocate for crumbs or am I going mm-hmm. to homeschool? And so we decided to homeschool him before we actually decided to homeschool older son. Yeah. I love how you say uh, we're going to be advocating for crumbs. That's that's. Oh, yes. yeah. That, that's a quotable. <laughs> I like because, that one. Yeah, it, it is so true. It, it's so true. Man, there is no need, really. Yeah. When, when, I guess, um, how would I say it? So, so I think it's, we have to believe in ourselves. As moms, as parents, we have to believe that, you know, we know best, that we can do best. And it's something that, it doesn't come naturally. Mm-hmm. But that, it, that is the absolute truth. You know, we know best our children, what, how can they thrive best? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's easier for us to say, you know, well, somebody else going to do it. Somebody else going to take it. If anything, it's just damaging even more because they, they, they will not, these experts will not take care of them the same way that we do. Yeah. And they don't have the same investment as we do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's so very true. And parents need to hear that over and over again because we get the, we get the other side way too much. Um, yeah. So I like- the next. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say my favorite line. I like your line about the crumbs advocating for crumbs. I like to say that I can spend my energy either telling other people how to serve my kid best and teach them how he works, or I can just spend that same energy just doing it myself, which is what we tend to do at our house. Yeah. Yeah. And it ends up being less energy and less yes. stress actually. Yes. <laughs> In fact, it's hard sometimes to work with the professionals because we spend so much time on a strength based, mm-hmm. um, outlook in our family that when I have to work with certain professionals or go in to the doctor for checkups and, right. you know, they want to know how he's doing as far as those milestones and those typical things. Mm-hmm. I'm like, well, he's doing great because he's well supported. Mm-hmm. So I struggled to come up with sort of that, like, oh, now That's we have to say response. all the ways you're not, yeah. you know, <laughs> how uh-huh. is he not like the other kids we need to keep talking about, which is true. We want to keep supporting that growth, but Right. We also want to keep him in that strength-based place where he does feel successful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I have to tell you a little, a, well, a little anecdote. Um, we had a hard time trying to find a developmental pediatrician that it was needed. So it took forever to get an appointment with her. And she's been with him since he was about three years old. Now mm-hmm. he's seven. At first, when I mentioned to the developmental pediatrician our um, thoughts of having him cyber school uh, and keep him home, and I try to, you know, patch it up with socialization with other groups, that was my idea. That's that's how I wanted to do it. Mm. She says, oh, no, no, no. I do not recommend that. I think you will be making a big mistake that wouldn't work for him. He needs Mm. a structure. He needs to be, you know, the discipline needs to be there, and he needs... mm, I said, okay, well, I'm still going to do it. Thank you for your input. I love that response. (laughs) A year later, uh, he comes for his regular visit. And she goes like, oh, my God, Miss Porcano. I guess I was wrong. (laughs) Whatever you're doing, just keep going because it's working for him. Yeah. And, and, and it's true. It's just we have to figure it out. And by paying attention and by following their lead, what it is that is going to work for them. Mm-hmm. I mean, nobody's going to give us an answer because they know less than what we know. Right. Yeah, that's so true. Yeah. And that's, that's a good mindset to have when going in and using mm-hmm. these public services like we're talking about tonight. Um, so the next question I had for you was, how have you used the public funding or public services while home educating your students? And how has your student and your homeschool benefited from you doing so? Well, hey, Chase, do you want to start? Sure. Um, so when my oldest uh, with profound autism was little, we took advantage of dual enrollment. And so uh, we were... So like I said previously, we were trying all different kinds of things. We wanted all the best therapies. We were trying to find the right fit for him. Mm -hmm. Um, He had started in the early childhood 
which in Texas was called ECI at the time. Hmm. Um, and so they would come out to the house. And then once he turned three, we were able to um, enroll him in public school, even without him attending PPCD. Um, and so what that meant is that he could get speech and OT free of charge. Hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And so we decided to do that as well as uh, enroll him in one of the special needs private schools in the area. When that didn't work, he was in uh, ABA and then eventually he came home all the while still getting um public school speech and OT. And we would just bring him up to the school and he would get speech and OT. And that worked out well. I mean, um, the, he was, I mean, we, we liked it. Of course it was free. And so it was like, well, why not? It's free. Why not? Mm -hmm. And, uh, what, what ended up happening too, was a good relationship with, um, the district administration because a lot of, um, a lot of what happens, especially at that age, is the uh, the people that are in charge of the homeschool services are really right. They work right below, um, at, well, in our district anyway, mm-hmm. the district special education admin. And so we were getting mm-hmm. access to um, the main speech therapist or the main occupational therapist at the time. And mm-hmm. so they were really able to kind of see what was going on and then help guide us. And then um, we were, then we would work with our, uh, dis, our, our the school that we were zoned to mm-hmm. um, sometimes to get speech and OT or sometimes we got speech therapy directly from the head speech therapist in the school district. Mm-hmm. So that was really neat. Um, and then it just kind of helped us develop a good working relationship with them later on when we sent our, our child to public school. Oh, yeah. 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 You, you already have those relationships and it's so important to yeah. have that. It's, yeah. It makes advocating easier. Yeah. And so, and then now uh, we are still, we still get speech. Okay. Uh, we still get speech for both boys at this point. Um, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Just kind of depends mm-hmm. on what speech therapy is available and what right. they're skilled in. For my oldest, he needs somebody who's highly skilled in AAC and not just AAC. He also has profound autism. And so he does mm-hmm. have several behaviors and his attention span is only so good. Um, and right. he needs functional, practical skills um, mm-hmm. and language. And so if you have somebody who is a traditional speech therapist, but might not be um, very skilled to work with children with profound autism, that's not going to be the right fit for him. Right. Um, mm-hmm. And and I would say that over the years, having the relationship with the school district, I'm able to ask for things that maybe they're not, they can't, for our school district mm-hmm. uh, can't provide um, or chooses not to provide curriculum or um include us in various electives and so forth but that just that's just our particular school district if Mm -hmm. i ask like hey we would really like curricula or you know what like your speech therapy doesn't work for me but maybe next year could you maybe Mm -hmm. budget this in instead um Mm -hmm. that may be something that a parent hasn't asked before and that they might be willing to provide the following year yes and because i've had this relationship with them since my son was three years old Mm -hmm. um it's not weird, you know, right. and, yes. and it's a working, yeah. it's a working relationship that I have with mm-hmm. them. And I, I've never burnt any bridges as I was looking for things. Um, we've all been on the same team. And so it's great. Mm-hmm. It's been good. 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 Yeah. That's great. Yeah. We do have some of those choices of speech or curriculum in our mm-hmm. districts. So. Right. And that's good to point out. So Cynthia, how about you? What, um, what have you used and how has that benefited mm-hmm. your homeschool? So you mentioned EI, Neche, and we actually missed EI because I discovered as my son approached his third birthday is really when the differences started to really stand out. So because we weren't getting EI, we were not on that track. And so to begin getting um, preschool services was a real roadblock for us because um, one kid with autism is one kid with autism. So 
for my kid, he had some trouble with um, pragmatic language. And so he would use completely appropriately, but he would use his lines from his play. So some of that scripting. Oh, yes. Um, and his TV shows, but it was always completely in the right context, as long as you knew the show he was talking about. <laughs> um, but he was also gifted and we didn't really have that recorded anywhere. And so that giftedness masked his needs. And so when we went to the district as a preschooler, um, we didn't just get no IEP. We actually got an IEP denial, which then was a bigger hurdle to climb to pursue services. And it wasn't until he was put in a classroom setting with the other kids, with those typical things going on, that you really saw his challenges. And then, yes, he got an IEP rather quickly. Um, (laughs) And that actually, we actually had that happen twice. Um, So, but at that time we were in Florida. And so he, when he was in kindergarten, then he qualified for what is now called the Family Empowerment Scholarship, which is specifically diagnosis-based and not IEP-based. And it's very broad in what it covers. And it's a financial amount um, budgeted by the state of Florida that you as the parent are in control of what are the best resources um, and schools. And there's there's a ton of amazing options of what you can do with it. Yeah. Um, and it can even be set aside as a 529 for college. Um, and kids have several years after they would typically age out to continue to use it. Um, so it's really an amazing program. And we were able to use it for many, for two years until we moved out of state. Um, and we spent a lot of it on books and computers mm-hmm. and parts for his sensory needs. So we got things like a hammock swing and stand and replacement parts for a trampoline because those met his sensory needs that he needed to learn and function and thrive. Um, yeah. If you want to learn more about that, I also mm-hmm. want to send you back two videos previous to this one because um, the representative from that scholarship actually was on my show. And so if you want to learn more about that um, family empowerment scholarship that Cynthia is talking about, mm-hmm. um, watch that episode as well or listen to the podcast. Yeah. So and then after so we only had that for two years because we moved out of state. Um, now we live in Illinois, as I mentioned earlier. And in Illinois, homeschoolers are seen as their own private school. And so we're treated as private schooler by our local district, which means we're eligible for proportionate shares of the school district's federal funds, Mm -hmm. um, which are allocated to the district for serving parentally placed private school students with disabilities. Um, So in Illinois, any homeschooler or private school student can walk to their, can contact their local public school district or where the school is located Mm -hmm. and say, I want an evaluation and the school district would give it to them. Um, So in Illinois, our services are IEP based and we took a season that was for our family. It was the best thing at the time. And we did enroll him for a semester. Mm -hmm. Um, So he was homeschooled from kindergarten through second grade. So the fall of his third grade year, we put him in public school. Um, And we kind of had got him on board with the idea because I wasn't going to do it, put him in there without him being on board because Uh the kids need to have buy-in. And that's even an important part, even in your homeschool to have that Mm -hmm. with how you do things. Um, So at 10 a.m. on the first day of school, he had a meltdown because he should have been done with school because in our homeschool, (laughs) we would have had lots of breaks by then. Mm -hmm. And we would have been wrapping up our group time and then they do their independent work and we're done by lunch. But this was public school. Yeah. Um, And they also were doing rounding for math, which if you have a concrete thinker, rounding and estimating are not um, not popular math math topics. (laughs) (laughs) So and I would say um, so he's currently 11 And we tend to sort of gloss over that repeatedly. And I'm like, over time, he'll kind of get the idea and we'll just kind of move on. That's not quite the same as calculating. He'll he'll probably be the engineer that gets it down at the six decimal point. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And even then he'll stress about it. (laughs) Right. Yes. Um, So he went to public school for one semester. Um, But the long-term benefit of him going for that one semester was that we were able to rewrite the IEP that he had used in a self-contained pre-K classroom. Um, 
and was able to get that so then we had that so that we could access the proportionate shares for the following Mm -hmm. school year Mm -hmm. um which in our case in our district they allow us to either do cross access a cross curricular teacher on a regular basis um speech therapy or um supplies so they purchase supplies on our behalf um for the student so that's what we're currently the services we're currently accessing Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's been really helpful to provide tools that we might not otherwise access things. I've bought things like microscopes Mm -hmm. or beakers and graduated cylinders, which they would have in the classroom, but as a homeschooler, we might not think to invest in. Mm -hmm. And so I don't have to think about that being part of the family budget and being worth it, but I can say this is part of his education. This would be part of his classroom. And so this is a tool that we can ask the district to purchase for us, um, so that he has that. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, a big, so a big thing for us was that IEP, he mm-hmm. didn't show up on paper as needing mm-hmm. the thing in the same way in the clinical observation, but the classroom right. struggles were very real. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, that's, that's a good thing to point out. Um, and sometimes you do have to make those small little sacrifices to get the, the paperwork that you need. Mm-hmm. Um, but I love that you got his buy-in. Um, and that he, you know, could understand the, the bigger picture. Yeah. What's going well, on and I will say out. when he was in okay. school, he was a different kid because mm-hmm. those sensory overloads, because of those challenges, because we had had, we do still have a very strength-based approach where any accommodations that would be in his IEP are just a natural part of how school is done. Mm-hmm. He saw he was different suddenly. Uh-huh. He saw that he wasn't doing the work like his classmates were. He knew he couldn't focus because he needed mm-hmm. to leave the classroom to have these breaks. He knew he wasn't able to finish the worksheets mm-hmm. like the class. I mean, his handwriting still looks like a second grader. I had him sign some Christmas cards today, mm-hmm. um, but he's 11 in sixth grade. Mm-hmm. And it's just part of who he is. And he learned he's a great typer. So life yeah. skills, he'll be fine. Yep, exactly. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, it, it's been a challenge at times, but it's also important. You know, we have enough challenges as it is, Mm -hmm. as special needs parents, that being able to access the services that fit your family Mm -hmm. are nice to have. Mm -hmm. Yep, so true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Marie, I know you you shared a a little bit when in our first question, but do you have anything to add on how you've used Mm -hmm. um, the public school services while homeschooling and how it's benefited your your homeschooling journey? Pre-COVID, we had everything in person. And Mm -hmm. we had OT in person, speech in person, and uh, you name it. COVID happens, and we continue with the same occupational therapist who's, you know, it's been a blessing for us Mm -hmm. and speech has been, you know, here and there. And when it's online, it's, it seems like it's less effective for him. Oh, okay. It's more like, yeah, you um, kind of heard, you heard from people one way or the other, someone was better and some, and some like, yeah, "Yeah, your son is worse. And, uh, and so for him, you know, because he very much just closes the the laptop and he's done. (laughs) He's like, hey, wait a minute, what is that? He was like, I I don't know. He's just to him. He's like, no, we're gonna. But but he's getting there. He's getting Mm -hmm. there because he still has to do it with the well, and he's teacher once a week. It's only Uh, seven, and so we're just working towards that. But in person, absolutely, it works best. And and what we are thrilled about is that the school is able, the cyber school is able to provide um, musical theater. Um, and, and all the different extracurricular activities that we don't mm-hmm. have to pay for. So that's, right. that's amazing. Yes. And, and he yeah. looks forward to those activities, aside mm-hmm. from the ones that we do, which is karate and, and, uh, mm-hmm. and hip hop. Oh, fun. <laughs> <laughs> His choice, you know. And, and right. so I'm, like, I'm, I'm thrilled. Like I said, I'm, I'm very happy. Some things work, some things had mm-hmm. to be put in the back burner that, you know, he is just not there yet. And some things that we can see it, you know, in the future might be something that, you know, he, he might be needing. So it, it mm-hmm. all depends on what phase he is. Um, you know, we just follow the lead pretty yes. much. 
Yeah, that's that's great. And and you're just taking it, you know, just one one thing at a time. And um, so, yeah. Mar- so, I wanted to add one thing to what you said, Marie. You said you saw opportunities he would see in the future that mm-hmm. he might pursue later. One thing I was thinking of and couldn't remember in time to say was the IEP that my son had when he was in pre-K, the needs that were on that IEP and the needs that we had on the IEP when he was reevaluated to the third grader was a profile of a completely different kid really? because he had grown mm-hmm. and changed. As yep. a pre-K, it was very sensory based, mm-hmm. even very pragmatic language based. Uh, but as a third grader, those issues were not the top issues. It was very much mm-hmm. the social and the attention. Um, and so our kids do change and their needs do change. And our homeschool lets us be really flexible to accommodate yeah. and let them grow mm-hmm. at their own pace. So, Absolutely. you know, take heart. It won't last forever. Whatever it is, it won't last forever. <laughs> no, it, it, it doesn't. And, I go around. <laughs> yeah, and, and I'm real. Yeah. It seems like as, when he's ready to make a leap, when he's ready to try something oh, new, yeah. it feels like he mm-hmm. throws himself in and, and it's like every day or every week is like he has done six months progress. And I'm like, yeah. okay. I, it's mm-hmm. just happening that way because he feels confident, comfortable. Nobody's mm-hmm. criticizing him. Nobody's telling him, no, you're doing things wrong. Of course, you know, we, we tell him what something needs to be that way. It needs to be the other way. And, and there is discipline, but for him to feel like, okay, I can go out. I, I see the friends. I can socialize a little bit, but he doesn't really, he's like a parallel plane. He plays mm-hmm. along others. Yeah. And he yeah. is starting to say, you know, okay, my name is such and this, but like I said, there's no pressure. There's no pressure. He yeah. feels that. Now, along comes a little sister who is three years old now and uh, it feels like it's pushing him to get out of his Mm -hmm. shell. And so he's like, oh, I don't want her to catch, you know, get as advanced as I am. So I better start, you know, my game needs to (laughs) get better. Mm -hmm. And so he's pushing, you know, he's working hard and and it's good. That's that's what we like to see. But again, it's, it's not on my terms. It's not on the teacher's terms. It's not on the... Um, therapist terms it's, it's on its own terms when he feels ready and confident to do such he does it mm-hmm. and and it is like a growth like a six-month growth once once he starts going that venue right yeah mm-hmm. so I know we've all kind of talked about this a little bit um, but Marie if you could just start us off with this question um, what what are some things that you're maybe a little bit wiser about with um, using um, different programs that you use um, and and also in asking for services, advocating for your student or communicating with um, the providers or educators that you work with. Um, well, I, the, the first thing is, I, I think I would say to student to, to, as a parent, be confident that you know what your child needs. Mm-hmm. That you have to convey it on everyone because it's very easy, you know, for us to say, well, I'm not an expert. I don't know any better than you. And, and then, you know, people are going to railroad you. you yeah. You're making mm-hmm. a big mistake. And the best thing to do is to really say, you know, I, I, I understand. I know what he needs and take, you know, listen, get all the options, put everything on the table. What's going to mm. work? What's not going to work? You will be the one to best know. And if you're, if your child can be involved, Mm -hmm. ask for his opinion, ask for her opinion, you know, because they will be the ones Mm -hmm. who have to be dealing with that day by day. Yeah. No, if the child comes back like with a full meltdown, it's not going to work. Well, okay. I will give it a little more time. And if Mm -hmm. that's something that you knew you were going to get into it, uh, this is how we're going to work. But to throw him into a place without them knowing what's going to happen. Where am I? What's, why is this? Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's it's causing more trauma than helping. Right. The intention is good, mm-hmm. but if he doesn't know where he's getting himself into, mm-hmm. I think it will be worse. You know, when he knew, when my little guy knew that he needed to go in a bus, which I was, ah, he has to go on a bus at three years old. And, you know, oh, because he, did, yeah. he was still wearing diapers and he was not ready for preschool. He just held me tight, but he knew. Mm-hmm. We explained to him exactly in his own words, this is what you need to do. This is what, and, and then you come back and you tell me. So he came back, he was happy. And he was happy to go every day because he knew this is what you're dealing with. Mm-hmm. Now, when he was, you know, when we knew, we saw that it was just, he outgrew it. Then we said, okay, you're done. We need something else. He's like, mm-hmm. okay, all right. 
you know? So, but it's explaining to him the entire time, just working with them the best you can with the child. Because the child, believe it or not, knows more of what he's able to do than he could even even mm-hmm. able to explain to you. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, Nijes, what about you as far as um, some of the things that you've, you've grown wiser about? And I know you talked a lot about this communication, this relationship. I love that. Do you have anything else to add to parents for advice on... I would, I I think that I would say that free doesn't always mean worth it. Yes. Um, Mm, True. And um, everyone wants to help. There hasn't been a therapist or a teacher who has said, hey, I don't want to help your kid. You know, Mm, everyone mm -hmm. wants to help, but not everyone can. Not everyone has the skill set to be able to help. And so what I have learned is to interview. And mm. um, and so especially um, in the position that I am now with our school district, one of the things that they're doing differently is they're, are, they are contracting with various private speech therapy clinics. Yes. And so mm-hmm. I can call around and I can say, hey, do you have somebody on staff who is trained in AAC and has mm-hmm. worked with children with severe autism? And if they mm. say no, then I go, okay. So then I go to the next one. And uh-huh. then when they say yes, then I say, well, can I speak to that speech therapist for a little bit to see if it would be a good fit? Mm. And mm-hmm. because um, it just, it takes, I have to be, we're doing virtual therapy right now. And mm-hmm. so I've got to be with him. Um, he's got to have some kind of a shadow if it's going to be virtual or if it's going to be in person, that person's got to know and be able to establish mm. rapport with my son. Um, and right. so I know him, so I know what's going to work and I know what's not. Um, mm. and I'm not going to spend the district's money and then have to shift and go, yeah, this isn't going to work, you right. know, in the middle yeah. of it. I don't, I don't oh, want to yeah. do that. Mm-hmm. Um, and the other thing that I recently told the district is I don't want to train someone. I don't want to train yeah. someone on AAC. Um, I don't, I, I don't want to do that. I understand we're going to have to build a rapport. But uh, if we're going to use one of your people or or even if we were ever to consider going back to the public school system, it took mm-hmm. so long for them to finally acknowledge that that's what he needed. They just mm-hmm. didn't have um, the, the personnel necessary. And so that's my big thing right now is right. I don't want to train someone. I don't want to train mm-hmm. a speech therapist. Yeah. I don't want to start. I don't. Yeah. Yeah. That's I, I would say that's uh, the biggest thing. And then two, Mm -hmm. as a parent, know your stress level and what you're willing to take on. Mm -hmm. Expect to advocate if you're going to work with the public school system, even if your child Mm -hmm. isn't enrolled in a public school, just to get that fund, just to get those funds and get the IEP written up and Mm -hmm. to get um, Mm -hmm. the appropriate speech services or the appropriate curriculum. They're going to have questions and Mm -hmm. you're going to have to answer them and you have to have your reasons and just decide what are you willing to do? How many times are you willing to pick up the phone, send those emails, you know, mm-hmm. create your written log to make sure that you've crossed your T's and dotted your I's? You still will have right. to advocate. And so mm-hmm. know what you're willing to tolerate in terms of your own stress level. Mm-hmm. That's great advice. Yeah. Great. Mm-hmm. So Cynthia, how about you? What are what's some wisdom you have from <laughs> Well, I would share. say with Macy, that's one reason that we had a big gap in having any services because we had about a year between moving and I kind of had heard about having the IAP with the school district and I wasn't ready to fight. I wasn't really mm. ready to make the calls and have the appointments and go through some level of trauma that I have from previous processes to, yeah, yeah you know, is. to go through right. that. And so it wasn't mm-hmm. a service we accessed. Um, mm. Then the time was right and we tried it for a little while and got what we need that we can continue to benefit from. Um, But I think one of my big things that I've learned and even how I learned about our services in Illinois was I talked to the local homeschool community, Mm. not, not special needs community, but the homeschool community. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I inevitably the same names would keep coming up about, Oh, talk to so-and-so because they have Mm. that or they have a Mm. child with some challenges And so, you know, that word of mouth is really helpful. And even just to find other professionals that may be pro homeschool, um, because we've all had the doctors 
like Marie was saying, that don't necessarily support or that thinks, mm-hmm. you know, well, if you just didn't homeschool, whatever. Oh, and so yeah. being able to find those professionals so that you can have whatever kinds of people you need on your team mm-hmm. to find people that can support or at least not discourage the choices that you know are working for your family. Or, or completely yeah. dismiss you. I mean, that, right. that's some of the examples mm-hmm. that we got. I was like, <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm like yeah, 24-7 yeah. with my so child. Hard. I think I, I know pretty yeah. much, but to be dismissed, that, I think that that was the worst. For me, was mm-hmm. the worst. Yeah. Is, is being no, I think one of the biggest compliments I got was when we were working with the school district when my son was in third grade is one of the school staff members actually asked if I had a degree in education because all the research mm-hmm. and everything I knew from homeschooling and the research I'd done to support my kids mm-hmm. um, made me sound like I knew what I was talking about. And he saw that. And I still consider that to be one of the greatest compliments mm-hmm. in having these conversations and pursuing these kinds of services mm-hmm. and felt quite validated to hear that in that discussion. Very good. You're, you're, you're making um, people turn their heads at homeschooling right. and not, not say, oh, mm-hmm. that's just for crazy people or, you right. know, <laughs> those cute people that want to isolate their children or, you know, yeah, yeah. it's, they, mm-hmm. they see the normal side of it and the benefits. Let me side. tell you that, that sometimes it's just, I don't even know when to say, uh, you know, stop with the socialization. It's like, that's too much. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, yes. I, I've heard that many times from homeschoolers are like, we have to stop socializing and actually do school. <laughs> But that's that's why I do the cyber school because I need to be <laughs> accountable for that. So yeah, because otherwise I'll be just be socializing the entire time. So mm-hmm. well, and I guess the other thing that we've done is with homeschooling and knowing that social was a part we wanted to target mm-hmm. is I put up with the years of co-op walking the halls in co-op with the child who didn't want to be there because Mm. I said, you know what, for these three hours of the week, we're going to work on social skills. I don't care if you write and do what your classmates do. Mm -hmm. Like you're here because this is like, this is when I'm making you social. Only three hours a week, you can stay home the rest of the week, but this is when we're going to target this set of skills. Mm -hmm. And we do that with other subjects too, where we'll target writing and not spelling or different Mm -hmm. things. But for social co-op became, it became therapeutic because yeah. in our homes, in our, the way I was seeing things, that's what we were targeting. And yes, mm-hmm. I walked the halls of the co-op building many, many weeks. And even in the last couple of years with him mm-hmm. in upper mm-hmm. elementary school, where he was yeah. not in a good fit for a co-op class and we had to make adjustments, um, but it continued to put us there, continued to have him develop at least familiarity with other kids Mm -hmm. that then we can see at parks and things. Um, But that became part of our school structure and a priority because Mm -hmm. those needs needed to be met as far as, Mm -hmm. you know, those IEP goals or other kinds of things for our school. Yeah. Perspective changes everything, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. It's just how you look at it. This is how we're utilizing this. We don't have to look like everybody else, Mm -hmm. but this it's, it's serving a purpose and that's why we're here. Yep. And, um, and I, and that's a, another question I wanted to address is, you know, these programs that we have access to in most states, they serve a purpose, but have you seen yourselves phasing in and out of them? I know some of you shared a little bit about that, but um, do you have anything um, specific to share about like maybe one time that you just said, either we have to increase or we have to decrease, um, or I, I see a change ahead and, and how did you kind of make that happen? I, I had um, with with Blake, with a, when he came to the speech, we, have not completely stopped it, mm-hmm. but it's not as um, as consistent as mm. we want it to be. And it's because it is online. Oh, yeah. I have him mm-hmm. already, you know, doing the school online and so much online. Like, mm-hmm. it's, it's just, it's one more thing for me to remember to put on the schedule and, and to try to figure out, yeah. fit it in. And aside from all the many activities that he has, that it just makes it very difficult. So. Mm-hmm. It's not, it's still supposed to be, he's supposed to be doing it, but, but there is no time to do it. And with right. occupational therapy, it's been wonderful because she's the one who actually is right behind him. You know, in every conversation that he has with peers, she's able to correct 
She's able to say, this is how you say it. I mean, mm. to the T, to be right there with him and say, okay, if there is a teacher, a typical teacher that does not mm -hmm. understand how autism works and she just wants him to sit there and this is what you're going to do. And mind you, it's just everything mm -hmm. that he does in person is because he wants to do it, not because he's forced <laughs> to. He's not forced to. But if he wants to do that, there is he's going to deal with other teachers that perhaps don't understand it. Mm -hmm. And so here it is, the occupational therapy, trying to explain to her, oh, teaching the regular, the typical teacher to, you know, this is how we deal with someone in the spectrum. Mm -hmm. And in every interaction, she's able to have some input and, and teach him, mm -hmm. this is how you speak. This is how you say, if you want to say something, this is how we're going to correct it. And so I, uh, to me, that's a blessing. To me, that's right. great because then I know that he's going to be safe. He's in a place that, mm -hmm. you know, somebody is, for now, that's what he's needed. I, I right. imagine when exactly. he turns 10, 11, he might not need that and, mm -hmm. and we'll see it. I, right. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's that give and take. And, you know, is this beneficial enough to be worth the sacrifice that I'm making? And mm -hmm. um, that's a great, great point. Cynthia or Neges, do you have anything to add to that? I um, Go ahead. Oh, for me, it's it's been about AAC and whether or not yeah. the district had somebody who was trained in AAC. Um, some years they did. Some years they um, maybe the person they had wasn't the person that had the necessary skill set, mm. um, and so we would decline. Um, but yeah, I mean, we but we ask every year, and mm -hmm. every year yeah. I discern whether or not um, yeah. it's a good fit. And mm -hmm. if it's not, we don't do it. And I don't stress about it. And that's yeah, um, so important. And if they have somebody, then great. Let's move forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. I don't burn any bridges. <laughs> right. Yes. Good. Good to point out again. <laughs> right. It's just either available or not available. And leave it at that. It's mm -hmm. yeah. It's a kind I mean, of I, begging for crumbs. That you I do about. know. Right. Like I, I do know that. Um, by right, if the services are there and the monies are there, that we can advocate mm -hmm. further. But then you just have to determine how willing are you and mm. um, how far do you want to go with that. And right. for me, I I just choose not to at mm -hmm. this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 What did you have to, to share, Cynthia? I have... So the resources that we've accessed, um, the two things I mentioned, the gardener and what we currently get with proportional funds are both a funding source um, mm -hmm. that we are able to provide resources. So that's not something that we've really increased or decreased or yeah. stopped taking mm -hmm. advantage of because it's such a flexible resource to us. That's a good point. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. But we've done a, most of our therapy has been through private sources. And mm -hmm. so we have done, we've taken a lot of, we've gone in and out of those at different times. Right. Um, and again, a lot like Nietzsche was saying about whether or not you get the right fit on a therapist. Mm -hmm. When you do, it's gold. And when you don't, it's, you know, Run it's away. not always worth it. <laughs> so, um, and we, we've had a mix. Um, mm -hmm. at different points. In fact, my one, one of my children, we actually did have an experience where I was thankfully with them and mm -hmm. the person we'd been working with, um, for a couple of years did not discern that there was a actual autistic meltdown going down and asked us to handle it in a way other than that. And we didn't go mm -hmm. back and going home. He said, why wouldn't she let you help me with my meltdown and help me get out of it? And, you know, we had a lot of conversations that not everybody mm. gets it, even those that are supposed to help us. Um, mm. You know, so we've gone in and out of speech and OT um, mm. and even just, I guess, traditional talk therapy um, yeah. at different points. And sometimes we'll do it for a while and be like, hey, this is working. Hey, we grew in this way. Mm -hmm. um, and even that person that we had to stop with services, we definitely learned some great skill sets and some tools and language to use as a family and added things to our toolbox. So it wasn't all bad. But mm -hmm. at that point, it was not going to continue to be a healthy relationship. And, mm -hmm. you know, he was involved and we wrote a letter to her and we said, you, you know, you are not skilled with working with the autistic population if you cannot mm -hmm. discern this after having the relationship with our family. Right. Yeah. And yep. we're we're done. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, and I think it's important to even help our kids talk through those not positive relationships because yes. they will encounter professionals 
exactly. um, throughout their life, throughout their life that had that. I mean, mm-hmm. so to know that not everybody will be supportive of them mm-hmm. and to help them into those relationships well. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a great life lesson. Mm-hmm. So. My son, even in college, had to advocate for people that like mm-hmm. that against him, and yeah. um, and he was prepared, which is important. We lost Nates for a minute. I hope she pops back on. But we have just like five mm-hmm. minutes left, and I'd love for you to each share some closing um, comments, advice for families who possibly are looking at adding a public funding option or a, a public um, services option um, and just any closing advice you have um, for them if they're kind of on the fence right now about that. So I, I would just say know what is what the rules are and what's available to you in your state and yes, be empowered exactly. with that information. Um, I know in Illinois, we have an organization called Equip for Equality. That's an Mm -hmm. advocacy organization that can help with some of that. Um, You know, I said that I get proportionate shares through my district, but we live in a Twin Cities area and the other city is a different school district and they do not allocate their proportionate shares Mm -hmm. in that way. And if I lived on the other side of town, we would get nothing. So... Mm -hmm. Um, be aware when you're looking for houses. <laughs> yep. Be aware, ask questions, you know, talk to your mm-hmm. home school community. Um, you know, and I think part of it is not enough people have worked together, have, de- have all decided that it's worth the effort to, um, lobby the district to say, Hey, we, right. we want this. We need this. This is ours for That's the taking. Point. Mm-hmm. Um, to see those things, um, just like the wider homeschool community has done that mm-hmm. for athletics or different points, that it can happen within the special needs community as well. Yes, mm-hmm. that's a great point. Mm-hmm. If you really feel driven to do that, I just encourage you to get some moms together, dads, mm-hmm. families, um, and advocate for yourselves. Um, because the funding is provided from the federal level. Yeah. The states and the districts decide what they do with that funding. And right. if, if you've got a let your voice be heard if you really think that funding is going to be helpful. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Um, Nate Chase, what, what do you have to share? I, I would say, too, that um, sometimes homeschoolers are a mystery to your local school district. And uh-huh. <laughs> when you, if you decide that you want services from your district and you approach your local school or whomever you think you need to contact, that might not be the person you actually need to contact. They might Mm -hmm. be clueless. So um, make sure that you contact the right person to get the right Mm. answer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great advice. Yes. A lot of times they have no idea. And keep keep asking, who's the person Mm -hmm. I'm supposed to talk to? Well, it can be a long process. Mm -hmm. Don't expect services tomorrow from your district because just like the IEP process in the public school is long, it can be equally long or longer as a homeschooler. Mm -hmm. Yes, true. Yes, that is very true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do you have to share? Well, I would say not to be afraid to check out also the um, the cyber school. It will be like a like a middle ground where Mm -hmm. you are not fully um, doing the homeschooling, but you do have the um, the district helping out with the book, Chromebooks, with the laptop, with the, I mean, you name it, even the, the ink, they give you everything. Mm-hmm. And that helps. That really helps. Not only that, but also the curriculums are already there and they are incredible. The stuff that now they're doing is just so easy and they mm-hmm. learn in a way that is painless. And I'm like, I wish I had that when I was younger. <laughs> so it's something uh, to consider. It's something right, to consider. Yeah. You know, and there's, there's lots cyber- of different cyber school options. Some of them will not accommodate special needs students. So you do need to ask. You, about and that. you the yeah. same way that you will do with a mm-hmm. brick and mortar school, you have right. to do your research. You mm-hmm. have to educate yourself about what it is that they provided, how long they've been, you know, in, yeah, in the, exactly. doing this, mm-hmm. how many, you know, and, and you name mm-hmm. it. You, you have yeah. to do your due diligence and, and, and find out find out what is going to work for your child 
And, yes. But don't be afraid. You know, there's so many options. You don't have to go to just one thing, say, you know, it's going to be old school or homeschool. You know, you could always find a middle ground somewhere. There are so many options. And that, mm-hmm. that's a great segue into what we're going to be talking about next month, because we're taking next week off. I'm actually not doing a broadcast next week. Um, but all next month, we're going to be talking about school choice and not just school choice as you can choose one option or another, but you can combine so many choices. Mm-hmm. Homeschooling is freedom. And there are so many choices involved in that. And so we are excited to share with you a lot of those choices next month. And so that's what our broadcasts and all of our blogs um, are going to be focused on. So I'm excited to be be sharing um, that with with all of you. Um, so thank you, ladies, just for all you've had to share. Boy, did we fill this hour fast. <laughs> it was awesome. So, um, but but thank you for just um, sharing your your wisdom. You've all been inspiring, um, just for for what you are doing in your homeschools. And um, so, thank you for just being encouragement and and a light into our community. Thank you for having us, Peggy. Good thank to meet you, you Cynthia. Good to meet you, Natchez. Yes, and so all of these ladies are on. The, the Sped Homeschool Facebook support group. So mm-hmm. if you you want to um, spend more time chatting with them, join join that group. It it has a lot of people. We don't we aren't always super chatty because well we all have special needs kids and we're busy. <laughs> but <laughs> if you have a question, stick it in there and it does get answered. Yeah. So um, so yeah, that's uh, that's great. And we just want to thank our audience for for joining us on this episode of Empowering Homeschool Conversations. You know, this is just one of the many resources that we have at Sped Homeschool. So um, definitely check out our website at spedhomeschool.com to to learn more about all the other resources that we offer. Um, and like I said, next week we are taking the week off, um, and and so starting in January. I'm going to have my Tuesday night back, and so are you, because we are switching to a lunchtime chat instead of evening chats. And so from 1230 to 130 p.m. Central is when we're going to be um, doing our broadcast starting next year. So um, and if you are still considering who to make a year end tax deductible donation to, um, we at Sped Homeschool are a 501c3 nonprofit, and we would love for you to consider that. Um, it, we're about $1,000 away from our goal um, of $4,800. Um, most of that has come in through our sponsors, which we are excited um, about, um, our partnership sponsors. But, um, but we'd love to um, be able to, to meet our goal so we can add some new team members. And so um, just check out our website on how you can make a donation um, to us before year end and um, make that tax deductible as well. So, um, so Merry Christmas, everybody, and Happy New Year. And um, we'll see you all in uh, 2022. So, so thanks again, ladies. This was just so much fun. <laughs> it was Thank nice. Thanks for having us. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Do you want to better understand the Bible and get biblical answers to those who ask you about your faith? Hi, this is Perseus Poku, host of the Sound Reasoning Podcast Show. Listen to us weekly as we bring the truth often found in the ivory towers of seminary down to the steeple towers of local church. Join me along with many of the nation's top theologians as we offer answers to life tough questions from an apologetic perspective. Subscribe to the show at lifeaudio.com.